Ching said, all right, I tell you what, let me go ahead and uh, throw open the uh, the camera here. Boom, you're on camera now. Yeah. Hey. Right, so, yeah, it's up to you. You, can, you know, so, hey, that's that's Kari Walgren right there. Yeah, I don't have a big, I don't have a big start. I just, uh, I just, I kind of go, Boom. you know. We just yeah, like no. jumped in. Yeah, we deep. just jumped in, you know. You're, you're good right. on the fly. I've. I have watched this woman read from across the glass from from the engineer's booth before because I'll come into a job and she's finishing a job and I'll think I want to get there a few minutes early because I see Kari is booked for, for me so I can prove to myself that yes those voices actually are coming out of the same person. You are so sweet. That's really nice. I, I paid to say those things. Yeah. Yeah. Bitcoin. Yeah. Got to jump on that Bitcoin. <laughs> no, I got to tell you, I've I've got a few credits on the IMDb, but people think, oh, Chris, you've had this long career and you've done so many things. It's like, let me introduce you to some of my friends and colleagues and you'll <laughs> see what a real IMDb looks like. Oh, so, gosh. Yeah, yeah she's, she's got a long, distinguished career and she's like 10 or 12 years younger than me. Now, you're even younger than that, I think. I don't know. It's all on the internet, so... Listen, yeah, there's no hiding. It's, Nothing's a secret you know, anymore. It's uh, it's no 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 uh, mystery there anymore. Sadly. Have you ever put up your own bio on IMDb and then tried to change it later? No, no, I I, I never have. But I have tried to correct things on IMDb that were not correct. And yeah. uh, good luck. Wow. This is not successful. I years ago like. 15, 17 years ago, I put my bio up on IMDb and it's like that Ray Romano bit where it, when you, when you're married and you pick a side of the bed to sleep on, he'll, that's your side for life. <laughs> so you better, you better be very comfy. So your bio on IMDb. Thank you. I read for voice match for Ray Romano. Hope I get it. Um, when you put your bio up on IMDb, you better make sure it's accurate because that's it. I have I emailed them and said, I am Chris Edgerly. I'm telling you, I want to change one thing about my bio. No. Like, yeah, but, I, yeah, I I don't know who put that bio up. Someone put the bio up, but... Right. Um, Wikipedia is a little easier because apparently anyone can change that. I've had more trouble with Wikipedia. Yeah. Because someone took a picture of me on a plane once and put it up as my, they recognized me on a plane. I've seen that picture. Yeah, yeah. And so they, they took a picture of me and they put it up on Wikipedia as my profile picture. And I, I tried literally for years to get something else put up on Wikipedia. They you won't. Do it. Wow. I think, I think finally something else got up there, but I don't know if it's much better. Well, yeah, I mean, you look like you're, you know, in a nice mood and you're smiling politely. But I thought this seems like she was maybe on a trip and she's maybe saying, hey, we're about to take off or fly into so and so. But usually it looks a little less formal. Usually it's more like a selfie. That's like somebody taking your picture. Yes, they they just recognized me on the flight, which was lovely. You know, that's very sweet. Right. Uh, just asked if they could take my picture. And so it's just like. But, but then you got to sit next to them for the whole flight. And that might be a little awkward if they're just, you just, you're trying to do something and you feel them just sort of staring at you. Hey. You know, yeah. Hi. Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> Could you do that voice? Oh man. You know, I always wondered like if, if people that are, you know, surgeons or something if people are like, Oh, can you just do like a surgery or something? Like, can you, can yeah. You just, like, Show me how you use your scalpel or something. Can I get this ringing in my ears while we're taxiing down the runway. Could you just sort of get in there and root around a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I always kind of wondered if they, they get that too, you know? Well, this actually, this is of a piece with how we <laughs> like to begin sometimes. I'll say, hey, how you doing? How you been? Well, all these little interactions you have with fans, you get really good at them from your convention appearances because it's a controlled environment. And you're just sort of ready for, you're ready for the interaction when you're in the wild, as they say, out and about with civilians who are not in the same business as you, we have a relative amount of anonymity, you know, yeah. me particularly less so because I do this stream now, but even then I don't have a lot of viewers, but when you get this sort of unexpected interaction, 
like that. Uh, is it something that, you know, you ever really get used to, or is it something that happens frequently? I mean, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's started happening more since social media and yeah. whole like convention uh, thing started, right. being, you know, more steam. Uh, um, because before that, you know, we, there was a lot more anonymity. And so right. then once, you know, the face and the names kind of got put out there a lot more, um, so it, it started to happen more often, but I always at first am convinced that they have me confused with someone else always because it, it's happened to me over the years. Like somebody will think that I'm someone else and stuff like that. And I have to say, Oh no, I'm not the gal from mad TV or, uh -huh. you know, um, when I was younger, I, I had a certain haircut that was exactly like Reese Witherspoon for a while. And so I had a little Girl Scout that thought I was Reese Witherspoon and like, it, you know, so, and then you're like, oh, do I lie just because she's a little Girl Scout and she's so excited, but you know, all that stuff. So, right. so first default always is just like, no, I'm not who you think I am. And then they yeah. like say my name and I'm like, oh, oh, I, uh, yeah. yeah yeah that is me oh my gosh yeah uh so i i would say that the the answer to that is how are those in-person things awkward they're awkward it can be i mean i i i have always loved the fact that um in voiceover we have selective fame is what i call it so you can go to the market you can yeah. go to the you can go to the hardware store you can go to the mall we used to have malls we don't have those anymore you can go out and see a movie. Nobody knows who you are. They've all heard your voice. They don't realize it, but they've all heard your voice in some form right. or another. Either it's a commercial or in a movie or on a TV show or something barking at them in the, in the PA speaker. And yet they have no idea. And then you can just enjoy uh, all the trappings of a nice, healthy career. But if you go to a convention, they will carry you around the hall on their shoulders because they, they know who you are what you do and they are really appreciative of it and it's perfect because then you can leave the convention and go right back into the anonymity yeah yeah i i do kind of like that uh i mean even at the conventions don't you feel like sometimes there's that that you know the sliding scale or the pecking order and it's well, like oh my gosh there's somebody here from star wars i'm yeah. you know, Power, well, you know? the, yeah, I mean, there's always a pecking order. Here. I'm always, I'm, yeah, crap. Well, yeah. What I, do I bring to the table? <laughs> I never did very many conventions because I liked being home. And now and I'm married with two kids, so I never leave my family. And my wife and I have only spent one night apart in, I don't know, since we've been married, we only spent one night apart. And that's because she had to be in the hospital because she was pregnant and she slept with my hat. I've told this story often. So it was oh. like, I know. So I left my baseball cap with her and she slept with that in the bed and I had to get up the next day to go record. And so it, just the hospital was way too far away. So, yeah. Can I just take a second? That is so cute that it like, it's almost physically painful. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm a little nauseous myself. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. But, but the point being is like, I never really did many cons. I would do, I, I've done a handful of comic cons and that's like the one you want to do anyway. But it was never me sitting at a table with merch and signing stuff. It was either being part of a panel or I went once with the creator of Adult Swim and Harvey Birdman, attorney at law. And he mm -hmm. said, he asked me, would you just sit next to me? I don't like conventions. I don't know what to expect. Fans creep me out. So would you just sit next to me and deflect some of it? I said, sure. He put me in a room full of people and I love it. And I noticed that, yes, a lot of times you get this. So who are you? What do you do? You know, because they don't, maybe they don't know the show as well. They just wandered by and like, oh, here's a table. What do you guys do? And, you know, suddenly you have to prove yourself. Oh, uh, well. You have to justify your existence. <laughs> you've got 60 seconds. Tell yeah. me everything you've done. And do all the voices you know how to do and do them funny. That's right. Tell me why I should care. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's, yeah. well, also, I guess a Comic-Con fan can be hard to impress because they're surrounded by legendary oh yeah people yeah and so yeah i just got to shake hands with mark hamill what do you do nothing 
I, I worked with him once. He's a nice fella. You know, yeah. You yeah. get a lot of that. Yeah, I feel you. Wow, this has been uplifting, yeah. Chris. Wow, well, thanks. <laughs> I do remember once sitting with the uh, Michael Owelins, his name. He created Harvey Birdman and like helped program Adult Swim. And um, this lady came up to me. I think she was wearing a Jedi outfit. I can't remember. Half of them are wearing Jedi outfits anyway. Yeah, I was going to say that doesn't really narrow yeah, it down. Yeah, that doesn't narrow it down too much. It's not a very good police description <laughs> of the assailant. But she came up with a uh, with a bag, unopened bag of Chewy Chips Ahoy Chocolate Chip Cookies. And she opened it. She says, do you want a cookie? I said, yeah. And I took one and ate it. And Michael looked at me with this look of horror. And she said, all right, I'll see you later. And she walked off and he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I like Chewy Chips. Chips Ahoy, I'm not going to not eat one. And he goes, never take something they give you. It's like, she's not going to roofie my cookie. <laughs> I, I saw her open it. You know, it's not like a Komodo dragon that bites you and tracks you down over the next five miles, waits for you to slowly conk out. It's like, I think I'll be okay. But the look he had on his face, I realized. That I, is kind of amazing. Yeah, I probably shouldn't do that again. That's like, you know, you never know what could be hiding in the bag. Yeah, time. she could have opened it and then resealed it. And, you know, she might have had yeah. a lot of time. You, right. you, you never do. You never know. You never know. Never How know. detailed was the costume? That'll tell us a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Um, yeah. Uh, this is one of the things about being uh, having the Twitch set up right in front of you and being a redhead. If I scratch any part of my body, it's red for the next hour. Nice. This is the problem of being pasty skin. So I'm looking at this little. I have the same. I have the same issue. Really? Yeah, I'm very, very pasty. You're you're blonde though. I mean, so you could probably get a little. You know, it. I don't know. I, I you you're not as pasty as me. Don't feel bad. Well, thank you. Yeah. I don't know. I I feel like we could. I could give you a run for your money, but. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're all inside a lot these days. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Whatever tiny bit of like ivory I had in the ghost white of my skin is now gone. It's gone. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's just <laughs> speaking of which, how have you been getting along? I mean, you're you're working. I know that because, uh, you know, for for us voice folk, as long as you have Source Connect and a good setup, then I haven't missed any jobs. I haven't lost out on anything. Have you seen any of the productions you're in? Because you're in a few. Did they have to shut down because they only do ensemble or have they found a way around it? You know, I mean, we are super lucky because it is one of the, the few industries that I know that has continued to kind of like adapt and find a way to keep working during this time. Yeah. Um, it, it's been interesting because like every studio and every project is doing things just slightly differently and they're on their own learning curves. Right. I found that with certain productions, uh, it was much, 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 much slower for them to start getting up and running again. I think some of them okay. were like holding out hope that this was just going to be like a few weeks and then we'd be back to normal. Yeah. And then after into a few months, they're like, well, we're going to have to right. figure it out to record. Right. Um, you know, other, other people within the first week were, were doing sessions. So, um, yeah, like there's nothing that's completely stopped. Um, there are a couple of things where uh, maybe they thought that they were going to do more episodes, but they cut it back a little bit or, mm -hmm. or there have been things where they thought they were going to start at a certain time period. And then it's been much, much later. Right. Um, yeah. I think the only thing that's like outright stopped at this point would be, you know, like motion capture jobs and such. Although so. I've spoken to a couple of people that have done motion capture in their apartment. That uh, is yeah. crazy. I, I don't know how they did that. I uh, apparently I spoke to Erica Ishii, who's done um, uh, some some voice acting. And uh, she actually had a show, I think, on GTV as well on, the, on uh, game TV. She said they sent her the entire suit. And they sent her the cameras and they just had them. They said, here's how you rig them up. And she did the movements. And I guess it was for maybe a single character scene or something like that. Because, yes, from doing motion capture shoots, it's like a film shoot. You have a yeah. crew. 
you have an entire warehouse they use. It's really hard to do it otherwise. And it's in a lot of its ensemble yes. acting as well. So yeah, that's fascinating though that. Yeah. Has anyone sent you equipment saying, no, we all have to use the exact same mic because we have a year of recording on this one mic and we can't do it differently? Um, okay, that particular thing hasn't happened for me yet. Now, everybody has had like, okay, we've got specific um, uh, setups, like, you know, this is how, what the specs under right. which we're recording and stuff but I haven't had anybody send me a microphone. I have had someone send me a GoPro. Really? To film myself doing the session. Interesting. Um, and I think it was for a couple of reasons. It was partly for like behind the scenes uh -huh. stuff, but a bigger part of it was like for facial, yeah. like expression. Yeah, and yeah like just to map out some stuff, yeah. Yeah, so so that was interesting uh, to you know get this little GoPro dropped off and then trying to figure out how to rig it and stuff. Yeah, I had one um, the uh, Apex Legends, the game I'm I'm currently known for most is Respawn making that game, and Respawn is uh, making another game that I'm in that I obviously cannot talk about, but they sent me because we had done motion capture for it. And they sent us the same microphone and skull cap. And they oh, wow. said, yeah, everybody gets the same mic and skull cap because we were at the point where we were doing ADR. And they said, okay, just for the ADR because all the motion capture has been done. So we want you, we're going to talk you through it, but put on the skull cap. Here's how to rig up the mic and here's how to adapt that into your Scarlet Mobile preamp. And they ended up with the exact same recording quality as they had <laughs> at, you know, the studio. So yeah, when they're willing to send you the equipment, they'll do it. But people are ingenious. Seriously, I I have been amazed at the creativity of some of these folks. Yeah. Well, speaking Get of which, all. yeah, how are you spending some of that free time since you're not able to? I mean, you can go out. We're all going out. We're just doing it responsibly, but. What are you doing with the gaps in time where you normally would be out socializing, you know, or performing because you do sing, correct? I do. Um, I, I would say that's what I miss the most is that, I mean, I've got this, this uh, band called Slot Her, uh -huh. tribute to a uh, band to the 80s, 90s hair band Slaughter. And uh, so we were gigging um before the shutdown happened and, and doing some live shows here and there which was a ton of fun and we were working on our first album uh so i would say the cool thing with some of this extra time in quarantine is that mm -hmm. i'm actually still working on the album it's been slower because mm -hmm. of everything going on and, and kind of like trying to figure out you're recording vocals is is kind of a whole different beast than recording voiceover. Uh -huh. um, so trying to figure out like how to make all of that work and then to get like musicians remotely recording things and then layering that all together. Um, it's just added a lot of steps to the process. But um, yeah, so I've, I've been spending some of my free time um, continuing to work on the album, which mm -hmm. hopefully will be out next year. And, um, uh, also reading a lot. Like I, I made the mistake back in March of saying to a friend of mine, oh my gosh, if I had a magic genie right now, <laughs> I would just wish for three uninterrupted days to just read and rest. Maybe four, maybe uh -huh. four. And like a week later, the world shut down. And so I have been reading all the time. So great. Like I almost feel guilty. So I'm, you're the one that caused all this then, in other words. I, and, I didn't want to come right out and say it, but yeah. yes, it's my fault. Apparently your psychic energy is a little bit stronger than you thought. You wanted four days. I think four we're on, months. Yeah, we're on month number uh, five, I think. Yeah. Something like that. Well, hope you read your book. I did. <laughs> what was it about? I don't remember. 
was so long ago. Yeah, it's yeah. a graphic novel. I forgot it. Um, you have a lot of words. Yeah, I actually uh, find that I have um, about the same amount of free time as I did before, which is very little. But a lot of that is just by default because I'm, you know, you're married with kids, and and the time yeah. I would be spending um, in traffic driving to a job or going to pick them up from school or taking them to an activity. I'm just spending helping my wife homeschool them because uh, that's what happens. Remote learning. We're now just going to homeschool from now on and say, forget the school. We're doing most of the work anyway. Uh, my wife actually is doing most of the work. So, yeah. So uh, between that's this and fun. yeah, uh, it's I feel like I can handle moving around the lack of uh, social interaction. I can find ways around it. The kids, on the other hand, they feel it much, much more. They need it. Uh, yeah, they need it. We're working on it, though. Man, I, I feel for my friends that are parents. I mean, I can't imagine how much harder that has got to make everything. Like, I've got cats. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing at all. Not if you ask some cat owners. I apparently, uh, they're... They're uh, needy. They're so needy. Are they? Cats, not dogs, huh? Well, I, I, I don't know about dogs, um, but I, I can say that I started out this quarantine with two cats and I now have three. Okay. My parents are very worried. They're like, this is the, the slippery slope into turning into a cat lady. But I thought, oh my gosh, I've got this extra time. I'll foster a, a cat. And she's uh -huh. so great. She's just like this like jaded senior citizen street cat with just like one gimpy little foot. Right. And she's just, I love her. But, um, but yeah, but they get used to having you around all the time. And then it's just like needy, needy, needy. They're every once in a while, I hear them throwing themselves against the door back there. So really, so, are you, so basically between the cats, obviously cats actually don't need a lot, you know, as far as you know, just put, put food around and they'll take care of the rest. Dogs have to be walked. So, you know, there's a, there's a big trade off there. But so right. between your jobs, I mean, and you, you, you're, you're a busy one. So you've got a lot of things in the fire there as far as the voiceover goes. And then between that and actually trying to create an album. Yeah. You, you know, you're, you don't have a lot of time to binge watch stuff. You know, I haven't done a ton of binge watching. Uh, I, I've, I've had little pockets here and there where I've, I've watched some things. I rewatched a, uh, a few of the Avengers movies just because uh -huh. I was that little dollop of hope and yeah them. Um, and and I did binge watch Fleabag oh well that's an easy show to binge watch oh you guys if you have not seen that show it blew my mind two days yeah, two, yeah. Days, just, two days and you're done did it the it's whole thing what is it about the British? They make a brilliant show and they say, 12 episodes, we're done. But we're done. I love the show. I want more. No, sorry. Gone. We'll pay you a lot more money. I'm sorry. We, we, we told the story. That's, you it's didn't awkward. want us to rule you so you don't get any more content. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's the price we pay. Yeah. Uh, Fleabag. I yeah. Um, I had no idea that show even existed. And uh, uh, the mother of one of my uh, son's friends said, Fleabag, watch that show. It's amazing. And I watched it. Basically, that show and The Crown were the two best shows I saw all of last year, both British shows, and both <laughs> polar opposite in terms of tone and production and everything. The, I'll have to yeah. check out The Crown. I haven't You've seen it yet. You've never seen The Crown? No, I hear it's amazing. It is. Well, first of all, if you got yourself one of those 4K TVs, Go out, if you don't have one, go out and buy one just to watch The Crown, just to watch the opening credits, because the opening credits alone are stunning visually. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. absolutely breathtaking visually. And then you sit back and you watch this show, and it's an amazingly mm -hmm. well-written and acted show. And even though it's about a very stodgy, stiff royal family, the inner turmoil that is churning is so expertly expressed. Oh, and it's yeah. so British. Oh, I love that. Yeah, if you're an Anglophile, then obviously you already know about these shows. 
But yes, the crowd uh, was the best thing I saw last year, along with Fleabag. And I don't think anything else was even close as far as what they attempted to do, what they carried off, all of that. Nice. So, I'm, I'm, I will have to check that out then because I, I am a lover of the of the Brits. Which is weird because your name, Volgren, means you were chasing them out of Dunkirk probably 70, 80 years ago. You know what I mean? Close. Close. See? Oh, Swedish. Uh, it's a Volgren. That's right. Okay, never mind. Yeah. See, if you would have said Finland, then I believe they fought with the Germans. But the Swedes, they said, no, nah, he's staying out. <laughs> yeah, the, the Swedes um, are, are my people, mostly. I have a little bit of Irish in there as well. A little bit? All right. Yep. All it's right. interesting. Okay, so here's, here's the famous story. And my mom's going to hate that I'm telling you guys this, which makes it like oh, even more well, funny. Then. So, so my dad's side is pretty much all... Swedish and then my mom's side has some Irish on it. So uh -huh. the famous story is that both sides of my family emigrated through Ellis Island. Okay. Like so there so my grandpa, my grandpa and my great aunts on my dad's side, if you go to Ellis Island, you can see all of their names wow. on, on at Ellis Island if okay. you look at Walgren. And um so you know they came majestically through uh, from Sweden through Ellis Island, started new lives here and everything like that. My mother's side, the Irish, there were a couple of them that were coming over from Ireland to America. And apparently one night, one of them got super drunk and fell off the boat <laughs> and didn't make it to the U.S., so I really feel like that right there tells you <laughs> the whole gamut, <laughs> the whole gamut of, of my story. <laughs> I mean, if there is a, ever a story, like if you were to hire a team of writers to say, okay, <laughs> I want you to tell me a story. It's got to be funny about an Irish family immigrating to the United States yes just please if you could avoid the most obvious stereotypes i'd appreciate that okay <laughs> uh one of them gets drunk and falls off the boat god damn, what did i tell you yeah no one's no, ever gonna believe that oh no, they're not gonna believe they're it they're gonna and protest they're gonna yeah yes <laughs> and then in reality well i'm just going to go out to the deck for a stroll for that's a right the mccarty's <laughs> i just want to go see the stars <laughs> what are you doing with that tray of uh, hip flasks? Oh, I'll take that upstairs and, and rinse them out with the seawater. Would you mind? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah so one of them goes over the boat. What? Yeah. It... Now, uh, yeah. was it like halfway across? Is that why? Or, or, or does it like as they were leaving the dock, they were already <laughs> shit faced. It's like, oh, I'll swim back then. I'll go back to Derry. I think. I think it was like halfway. Oh, okay. So sadly, um, yeah. Sadly, that was, okay. Well, that was one. So there was one less Irishman in America. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, it depends on how many decades it is, but there's a there's a certain amount of time you're allowed to laugh at somebody falling off a boat, you know, if they don't are make it. Still, but, are we still in the window? I think we can still. I don't know. Right? What was it? What, at Ellis Island, that had to be at least 100 years ago. <laughs> Man. Once you hit a century, I think you can laugh. I think it's I okay. think so too, right? I think so. Yeah. I, it just it just absolutely cracks me up. Um, well, you know, uh, uh, stuff happens, and sometimes yes, you guys, man. I mean, you know, hey, my dad was in Korea, but in the '60s, before you know, after all the the official military actions were over, they were just occupying. And he says, I was straight out of paratrooper school, and I thought I knew what I was doing. And he was a captain. He says, I had no idea what I was doing. And I proceeded to get our entire uh, company lost in a snowstorm in the middle of Korea. And my staff sergeant knew exactly what was going on, but he refused to help me because I was too proud to ask for help. And he says, at one point in the middle of the night, we ran across another company in the middle of the night and we just opened fire. So the two sides are firing at each other because we thought they were Korean. And then one guy got hit. He, he didn't get killed. He just got hit like in the arm and he cursed in, in English. And they said, oh. Oops, sorry. And it was, he says, I got my company in a firefight with another American company. And oh. luckily, 
My gosh. Yeah. Well, I don't know if my dad caused it, but it was just friendly fire happened a lot. And this guy only got wounded and he says, okay, uh, sorry about that. Yeah. So yeah, shit happens. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. And so he could laugh what, about it because nobody was mortally injured or anything, but yeah. At what point did he say, or did he say, look, I got nothing here. I'm lost. It was like day two or three. He says, I finally swallowed my pride. And I went to the sergeant and said, uh, sergeant, I have no idea where we are. I have no idea what I'm doing. The sergeant said, Zero is going to give you one more day. <laughs> and then, and he was going to step in. So yeah, he says, after that, we got along great. When I realized that I was an idiot um, and that I had a lot to learn. Uh, yeah, he says, you realize if you go to any company, the sergeant is always the one that knows everything that is going on. The the captain may may bluster and, and puff his chest out, but the sergeant's the one that knows what the hell's happening. Wow. Yeah. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't know how we got into that story, but you know. That's a good story though. That's some, that's some good uh, genealogy. Yeah. Throwbacks right there. Now, as far as uh, the stuff you do get a chance to watch, do you ever watch your own shows just to sort of grade your performance? Or do you just sort of say, nah, I did that and I'm going to move on? You know, I, I watch sometimes. Um, I usually try to catch like an episode of okay. something like if it's a series okay um it's just a uh, man i'm just so hypercritical okay of myself that it's it i can't relax into it and, and enjoy it usually mm -hmm. there's a couple of shows like i you know i work on rick and morty and that one i actually enjoy watching just as a a fan mm -hmm. um so, so that one I can usually kind of like disconnect a little bit and, and just watch it for fun. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's just hard to watch stuff and not be like, eh, oh my God. Eh, eh. Yeah, is there, well, Rick and Morty's got to be the one that gives you the most like street cred too, because that show is, is uh, as far as the following people, I've never heard people gush about a show as much as I have heard them like heap praise <laughs> on a show as Rick and Morty. And I've not really ever watched it, but I saw one episode, it was a time travel one. And I thought, this is pretty amazing that they would do that with the storyline. It's, it's so smart. It's, yeah. it's like this crazy, crazy mix of super smart and gross out humor. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, there there are certain times where like I'm I'm watching I'm watching an episode and I'm like this is a little over my head as far mm -hmm. as these literary references or mm -hmm. you know some of the science that they're talking about I'm like mm -hmm. this is a little too smart for me and then mm -hmm. they'll throw in like a fart joke or something and I'll be like ha, okay oh now you've got me yeah, you won me back <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah but it it is interesting um. Uh, Justin Royland and I, we had worked on fish hooks for mm -hmm. Disney together before that show. And then, you know, he had come out with his pilot and stuff like that. And so the audition came through and everything. And so he had cast me as uh, Jessica, the girlfriend mm -hmm. or the love interest um, at uh, Morty's school. And uh, then they just started, you know, they got the, sh the show got picked up and everything, but it, it's been really crazy to see what's happened with it. You know, just mm -hmm. going from the beginning of like, oh, this is this pilot that this friend of mine put together and stuff like that to see it turn into basically this worldwide phenomenon. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, somebody was yeah. asking, do you ever get surprised to hear your own voice in a show or movie? I don't know if I've ever been surprised because if something's on, I'll remember if I worked on it or not. I might not remember everything that I did in it, but I've, I don't think I've ever been surprised. You know, usually you, you have some awareness, even if it's a while ago. Yeah. I mean, the biggest surprise I would say is just sometimes if I'm in the other room yeah. and something comes on, I'm like, Oh, I think that's, <laughs> or, you know, yeah. That's kind of an odd sensation. Um, and, and it's the same kind of, I mean, as, as you get, I'm sure Chris, this is the same way with you, but as you get more and more into the business too, it's, you just can hear stuff and you're like, 
Oh, that's John. Yeah. Oh, so and so. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's Marsh. Yeah. Oh, that's. So it's it's almost like you get really really good at pegging who is who is talking. I have less success doing that with you though, because my kids watch a lot of shows that you're on, but you're doing so many different voices on them. Aww. Though. So like your your Kung Fu Panda, your your Tigress, right? That's the the Angelina Jolie voice match. But as as someone who is also voice matched an actor, when you do it for a series, a lot of times they'll they'll start with you voice matching the actress or actor. But over time, they may allow you to begin to color it just a little bit and make it your own. Okay, this is TV Tigress. That's the movie Tigress. You've been doing it for dozens of episodes. We're going to let you make it a little more Kari or however you choose. Absolutely. And I think that's such an amazing, uh, amazing point. And, and sometimes they really push you away from the voice match. Um, I, I, the story I had heard with Kung Fu Panda is that it came down to another actress and my, and myself for the part. And I heard that the other gal sounded a little bit more like Angelina Jolie, but that the acting choices that I was making were mm -hmm. a little funnier or something mm -hmm. like that. And so I remember when I got that role that in the early episodes, I was really, really locked into this idea of like, oh, voice match, voice match, right. voice match. And they kept getting to the point, this point where they're just like, no, 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 how would you interpret this line? Yeah. You know, what kind of comedic timing would you bring to this? Mm -hmm. And stuff like that. And so they really um, loosened it up a lot more and kind of let me have a little more freedom yeah. with the role. It's nice. By the way, the other actress that you beat out was Angelina Jolie. I don't know if you knew that. So Listen, just, I didn't want to uh, say anything. I didn't want to yeah. name drama. It's like, okay. Yeah, she does sound a little more, bit more like Jolie, but not as funny as Kari Walgren. So, sorry. <laughs> you, get to, uh, you get to break the news to her. Nobody wants to see her mad, but, uh, you know, you got to do it. Yeah, so. Right. I found that with, uh, with uh, I did Gobber for, um, as I did Craig Ferguson's voice match for Dragons Race to the Edge and Riders of Burke, you know, based on how to train your dragon. Now the actual voice match audition probably was like your your uh, Tigress audition, extremely rigorous. Technically, the most difficult audition I've ever gone through because the director made sure that I was, I mean, to the syllable, recreating the lines from the movie. And wow. Yes, which I'm fine with because it helped me book it. Once we got in and started recording, and this was over a period of four years or so, I found that they were okay when, when I would make Gobra a bit more pronounced and, and larger than in the movies because the movies have quieter moments and a, a bit less of Craig sounding like Craig from the show. So they were okay with that because the tone of the show was not exactly like the tone of the movies. Right. So they're thinking, tonally, we want this to exist in its own universe. So, yeah. Yeah. So That was great, too. I was just I, listening. Well, to thank you. Um well, I have to do something to, you know, to, you to keep up. Yeah, I got to do must something. Just for my personal Exactly. Interview. I like when somebody comes on here, and I always end up saying this in the chat. They'll say, who's he interviewing? It's like, well, her name is right there. And in the time it would take me to tell you what she's done, you can type that name in this web search thing called Google, and you'll know instantly everything you need to know. <laughs> But usually people just like to know instantly everything. They just don't want to be told, uh, go look it up. Yeah. You know, our, our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter the faster our technology gets. I mean, do you yes. remember before even Amazon Prime? Like now if we have to wait more than a couple of days for something to get delivered, it's just like, ugh. Hey, I don't remember what I had for breakfast an hour ago. So, um, same, actually same. No, there was a comic who made a very funny reference to that. He said, I've gotten to the point now where I click, and this is before the pandemic. He said this, he said, I click buy on Amazon. And as soon as I click it and it says transaction completed, I turn around and I start staring at the door. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. about. But my theory on that is that, uh, well, there was a 60 Minutes episode about these things we have, our little phones. He said, this is a slot machine. And when you play the slot machine, you're looking for the three cherries. You're looking for the payoff. 
It says what happens when you're doing the slot machine is you're looking at your apps, your Twitter, your Facebook, your Instagram. How many likes? How many notifications am I getting? How much interaction am I getting from this thing? Because every time you see a like or a, or a share or a, a retweet, a little bit of boom, dopamine, a little bit of serotonin <laughs> happens and you get addicted to that. And he says, this mm -hmm. becomes like a slot machine. And he said, one thing I would do is I would remove the notifications from your home screen. So like on mine, the only notifications I allow to be seen on my screen are on Cameo because I need to know, you know, so I can respond quickly when somebody requests a Cameo video. And the other is my, uh, my messages because I need to know if somebody's texting me. I don't have notifications on for Twitter. I don't have them on for no, Twitch. Nothing for nothing else, not even for my emails, because I don't want to be too tethered to this. And I already am. Yeah. Yeah. I get that, that weekly report. Uh -huh. I'll like, Hey, your weekly usage is up 20% to 23 hours a day, you know, or whatever it is that, you know, however much you're on there. And yeah. it's just like, sometimes I look at that number. I'm like, Ooh, it's a yeah. well, it's, you know, for what, for what we do, I, it's a, there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance. On the one hand, I hate watching commercials. On the other hand, commercials have, uh, have um, you know, they, they bought a car for me. So right. I, I try to keep that in mind is that as I'm cursing this thing that is keeping me from the content I want to consume, it's also, uh, you know, helps pay the mortgage. And so, you know, we, we, are, we have a hand in a lot of the content that people enjoy but a lot of times they can use it to distract themselves from doing productive things. But yeah. I look at it like pizza, right? I like pizza. I don't eat pizza every day. I have it maybe once every couple of weeks, just like junk food. I have it once a week. So I don't want people to stop making junk food. I just know that I'm going to be careful in how I consume it. That's what I would ask of anyone else. I don't want to stop making the junk food that I'm spewing out into the world but I'm not asking everyone to eat it every day, like, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I think I lost the metaphor somewhere in there just because you distracted me with pizza. Yeah, I started <laughs> talking about pizza and then, oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but I'm going to nod as if you said something very, very safe. Sure, sure. I'll edit something in later. Um, I, uh, I'm going to get that AI program that allows me to take your voice and AI it and recreate it. And, Hello. uh, have you heard about that? I have not, but it sounds terrifying. Yeah, it is. Um, I had somebody on Twitter, an aspiring voice actor ask me, Hey, I'm doing a text to speech audition, or at least I got offered the job. And they said, I have to sign this release form. And it basically says I have to, um, just basically acknowledge that they're going to take my voice and create new dialogue with it for as long as they want because it's a text-to-speech like Siri. So Siri apparently is based on a woman's voice and they've used AI to make her say everything because nobody has time to sit around and answer every single question that Siri gets asked. So they can take our voices and they can recreate them to have them say anything they want. I just hope that that person got paid well like Siri <laughs> like the actress that did Siri. Did she I, get paid well? I believe so. I hope so. Yeah. I, yeah. I had to consult a, a fellow actor and ask them, somebody who's been around a bit, and ask them what they think. And they said, that sounds like something that would be like a theme park ride where you would get paid in year, like three to five year increments, you know, just sort of acknowledging the fact that we're not going to give you residuals based on how many people go on the ride, but we will give you usage fees. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I do not know, but I do know that the technology now exists for someone to take a recording of you and then use it to deep fake your voice. Now they may not make the same acting choices you would, but they can make it say things with different inflections. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of terrifying. That's uh... yeah, a little bit. So, yeah. so you, I don't know. I give it about five more years before, uh, you and I are, I don't know, I'll be auditioning for Slot Her, I guess. Woo! I just want to be a roadie. I just, <laughs> man, I just need something. 
well, we're going to need you to pick up that amp and carry it across. I'll do that. The, the just, audition. just carry some heavy stuff, dude. Just <laughs> carry that across the room. Yeah, that's all. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know if that's something that is going to, uh, I don't know. I think the union's going to have to deal with that at some point because uh, there was a company that, that was actually touting this technology. Look, we created a voice from scratch and had it act a part in a video game just as a practice thing. And um, uh, they were, they said, and what's great is when we have a voice actor come in, we can map out their voice and then we don't have to bring them back for edits or anything like that. We could just use it to create more of their performance. And I thought, that's great for me. How? I don't yeah. understand how that's the remotely good for me at all. They were I'm so thrilled. My money, kids, I'm saving my money and I'm I'm working on my bur burger flipping technique. Do that. Good. Start yeah. start putting that money away. I I give us five <laughs> years, and then I have no idea. I uh, got my eye on this place in northern Spain, and I think that'll be it for me. Oh I my think, gosh! Uh, we'll yeah. have to, actually we'll have to talk about that because I'm looking at Spain as well. Are you really? I am. Okay, so what was it? Was it the pandemic life that made you start thinking? You know, I could do this from anywhere. Or was it just, you know, after a certain amount of time, I'm done with traffic? Um, you know, both. I okay. mean, it was always kind of like a long-term idea. Right. But definitely there was that thing of, well, maybe, A, this could be done remotely mm -hmm. sooner than I thought. Right. And then also there's, you know, so many changes and stuff in the industry. It's like, well, you know, maybe it's... Maybe it would be a new chapter or something exciting to explore. And, yeah. you know, I really want to travel more. And right. Like I don't know. And, you know, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. But, yeah, I'd love to talk more about Spain with you. Okay. Because the advantage that actors in our situation have, and I think you have it more than I do, is after your name is established enough, the casting directors already have sort of a, uh, a circle of actors and actresses that they've worked with multiple times that they automatically know are going to be right for a role. And it doesn't mean they hand it to you, but it does mean that you're on a short list of people and you'll get a crack at it. And so you'll get yeah. a crack at it. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll get opportunities. You don't have to kick the door open. The door is open. You're in the room now and you've yeah. got a comfy chair. And in this case, they won't care if you can't make it in personally because they'll be able to get you on record. You know, they'll be able to get you recorded no matter where you live in the world. And as long as they have that, they're, they're fine with it. And so uh, I talked to James Arnold Taylor about this on the stream recently. And he said, I'm to the point now where I can do just about every job, even if there was no pandemic. He says, I think I'd be able to do every job from home because I have relationships with these uh, directors and production companies and all that, and they know what they're getting. So in your case, there would this if somebody's new, then yes, I would say move to LA and make every contact you can possibly make because that's how you get in. They need to see you, they need to be in front of you. But after you've built up enough of a body of work, I think you could, if the technology is there, it would be easier for you to just live anywhere and do this. Well, I mean, we'll we'll see. You know, it's uh, it's definitely entered more of the conversation yeah. since, this, since this pandemic started. I think for a lot of people, I think a lot of people are, are um, reevaluating like, Oh, what could be done at home or what could be streamlined? Right. Um, yeah. I, I will say I don't miss traffic. No, at all. I don't no. miss commuting for a single second. That part. Uh, it's great to work from home. Yeah. Um, you know, I miss seeing, people um I, I i miss the engineers a lot yeah. you know stuff like that uh but yeah i don't miss the drives oh. no. the drives are something and and uh yes like you i miss the camaraderie you have when you are doing an ensemble record i miss the jokes yeah. and the fun i miss uh popping into my agent's office once a week just saying hello because i i hardly ever i was hardly doing any auditions there anymore I would maybe once or twice a month, I'd go in and read something just because I didn't want to have to fool with it at home. 
but for the most part, um, no, the traffic was, uh, yeah, traffic is highly overrated. So, it's, yeah, no, not great. Yeah, not great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, <laughs> as far as um, as far as like your home setup, because I know a lot of people on here actually want to know more about. Oh, what do I need to get into the business? What do I need as far as my equipment? What kind of a home setup? do you have like I have a booth that was custom made and it's still not even top end it's just it's nice it it works fine it gives me broadcast quality results but what kind of setup do you have and did you have to um, change it much when the pandemic hit well i um i actually have a tiny basement in my okay. house which is which is unusual for los angeles yeah uh but when i was um house hunting um you know i looked at this particular house and there was this little tiny basement uh that was pretty much not big enough to do anything with except a studio right like it wasn't big enough for a bedroom or anything but it's just it was just this perfect size for a studio Mm -hmm. and that was one of the big selling features for me on the house and so um once i moved in i had all of the walls and the ceiling soundproofed Mm -hmm. and then um i've got uh let's say i've got a microtech gefell m930 Mm -hmm. microphone and just have it go into a scarlet focus right and then it goes into my laptop and yeah, it's it's pretty much all set up there. I mean, so the whole setup hasn't really changed much since the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, the bigger thing since that happened is the the new connection technologies, mm-hmm. like learning Source Connect, learning Connection Open, learning how to um, you know set up Zoom and Google Meet and something else at the same time then learning how to file your stuff correctly and upload it correctly or, you know, install this Dropbox or that box or, you know, all of that has been the bigger learning curve since the, for me, at least with the, with the shutdown. Has anyone asked you to do any kind of engineering to the file itself or do they just say, make sure it's a wave file, uh, 48, you know, project rate, 24 bit, and then just we'll do the rest. They pretty much, yeah, they pretty much just have me record it. Now, it, it is interesting, like certain clients will be like, okay, so before each take, we need you to clap and then we need you to slate the take number. And I got to tell you, like that, those have been the hardest for me because I'm trying to like, God forbid, look at my script and make an acting choice on my yeah. line, you know? And so it's like, Take 16, yeah. 35, yeah. I'll never see. So so what I started to do, and I think I think maybe Bob Bergen was the one that that gave me this suggestion. He's like, I started slating in character. Oh. So it'd be like take 67. Well, I don't know if I want to do that with you, young man. You know. So except with Bob, if he's doing Porky Pig, those are the longest slates. Take it. Yeah. Yeah. You should hear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You should hear him do it. It's, it's hysterical, <laughs> but it actually, honest to God, it helps. So once I would start doing the, the slates in character, it would just not be quite as much of a, a mental switch. I, I only had to do that once. I didn't have to do the claps, but I would, I would slate the number for each one. But luckily I don't think I was having to do um, anything but my own voice. It was for something that was less of a character project, but I, I do not, I mean, man, if I was doing like he for Naruto, like this despicably evil character slating in character would be, yeah, that's a challenge. That's a technical challenge. challenge you're not expecting. And then if you're in like, you know, if, if you're, like I read a lot of times my script off my cell phone or something like that. So then you're trying to like tuck it under your arm and 16 and you know, it's like, it's just so awkward. Yeah. I think that's partly just me. Well, I mean, sometimes like uh, Robert Duvall, one of my favorite actors ever says that his style is offhand. He says, I like to do everything offhand, even when he's going fishing. He says, I, I just don't know. I don't have a set way of doing things. It's offhand. 
because it feels real and natural. And when you look at his performances, he's very much like that. He's usually, yeah, yeah he just sort of comes by the scene in a roundabout way. And so maybe you just have an offhand way of doing things and it's just uh, when, or maybe your way is more regimented and when you have to be offhand, you have to get yourself back into that headspace. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm trying to reconstruct your physical space in my head. Say, okay, what can we do with Kari's space to make it easier for her? See, what I've done is I have an iPad and I've mounted it above my laptop. My iPad gets the actual same, it's the same account as my, as my uh, Mac laptop. So I'll get the script on email and I'll open it on the iPad and I can look straight here. And then the mic is right about here. And so I've got everything in front of me. See, I've got an iPad, but it's it's old. Okay. So it's um, it's not always the most reliable. Ah, yeah. So you get yourself a new iPad. They're not. They're not. You've no. got the. You've got the money. Listen, I what just. Are you gonna... I don't want another gadget. Well, you just throw the old one out. So that's the thing is that you you replace the old one. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I don't want any more of those fangled contraptions. Is this this Midwestern <laughs> thrift that I have never heard of ever? It's New Englanders that are supposed to be thrifty. Whereas what? you're a Midwest gal, right? Oh my gosh. Are you I, I've spent a lot of time in the Midwest. I don't I mean they don't put on airs, so they're not oh. hoity toity. But the you're a thrift. You're what, a are Kansas you? girl? Kansas girl. Okay. So, so you just don't want to waste anything. It's, oh my gosh, the, the thrift. Okay. Um, now I understand. Yeah. It's all coming together. Well, it's, it's, oh my gosh, you, you, you have no idea. Like I'm, I'm downgrading a number of things right. since the, the quarantine started. Uh -huh. like, oh, I don't need that now. Now do I, how important is that? I don't really need to. I could save at least a hundred dollars a month if I stopped doing do you, that. Do you have doilies on your coffee table now too? Is it? Are we going to get that Midwest? Are we going to get? Uh, no, but I do have. I've got cup holders, just like or little, uh, you know, coasters. I've got coasters. Okay, because I've seen you before on the social media. Maybe you did this more on Facebook. I haven't been on Facebook in years. I got off in 2016. I'd had enough. But okay. I've seen you put up pictures of like when you were a kid. And I think the one that sticks in my mind was you when you were a fish. You had you with a fishing pole. And I yes. thought this is brave for her to post that picture because I was pretty dorky oh. as a kid, but I deprived the world of those pictures. Oh, I, I, I'm a but giver. Yeah. I think you've you got are. braces and, and glasses. Listen, my pants and a trucker are hat. up to my neck. Okay. Yeah. My pants are pulled up to my neck. I've got the huge glasses. I've got a ball cap. I would, I had the Dorothy Hamill cut for most of my young life, mm -hmm. you know, bowl, just a bowl cut. Like, yeah. Bowl cut. It, yeah. Down around that. Okay. Prince you know, Valiant. It was pre braces. So like things were just like really getting funky. Okay. <laughs> it's just like, uh, yeah, there, there are a couple of, uh, there are a couple of real winners that I've posted on Instagram, but okay. But that's good. That's good. I think people need to see that because uh, I think people don't always realize the journey from being that that dorky kid that I know all about into somebody that people later on see as this. Oh, look how successful and oh, look how glamorous their life seems to be. Blah, blah, blah. No, no. I, I'm letting you see what I want you to see. And look at where I came from. A lot of people feel like yeah. outcasts, outsiders, outliers, freaks, geeks, you name it. It's like, dude, that's our tribe. Oh, this man. is just visual proof of it. It's, yeah. I, I, I figure at this point, you just got to embrace that. You know, it's, it's, it's so much of that dorky stuff that makes you, it's kind of a cliche, but like mm -hmm. the stuff that made you dorky and kind of weird in your own little way when you mm -hmm. were young is actually what, goes on to make you successful yeah. later on yeah. you know i was the 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 weird little kid that was always like running around the house doing voices and, mm -hmm. and you know acting out plays and singing and things like that and and 
fast forward and that's that's the stuff that that makes you <laughs> weird later on i guess yeah but you know you <laughs> you've monetized your weirdness and... i monetize your weirdness exactly that's... now as a kid were you able to find a few other kids that were like-minded or was it just always sort of you were on the outside you know looking in you know i was always kind of on the outside looking in i i did gravitate when i got a little bit older like all my friends were older mm -hmm. so you know when i was a young high school student all my friends were upperclassmen and and stuff like that so you know i, I would i would find my tribe but it was kind of hard because they were usually older so they would graduate first or or, or something like that but yeah so there was a lot of I don't know. There, there was a, a lot of of not quite fitting into the the mold where I grew up. Mm -hmm. Well, a little bit of fish out of water. Right. Well, and that is hard as a kid um, because when I started doing stand up and you start touring as a comedian, you tour in a three man show and uh, you don't all tour to the same places together, but just you go to the club and they've thrown three comedians together to make a show. There's the MC who goes on first, the opener the middle act, and then the headliner. Now, the headliner is the most seasoned, experienced veteran of the show, usually, and the most confident. The middle act is just some, you know, step in between, somebody who's still finding their voice, but they know what they're doing. And the opener has no experience, usually no confidence, and barely a sense of who the hell they are. And that's who you make start the show cold. And we always said... I don't know why you throw the most inexperienced person out there first. You're throwing them to the lions, but that's how you learn. And it's brutal. It's a brutal oh. experience. And a lot of people don't survive it. They just get into something else. That's kind of childhood. You're the opening act. <laughs> you don't know anything. Everybody oh. that has all the best material is older, cooler, and experienced. And they get the best response. And you're sitting here with your props and your 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 dumb impressions that you haven't written anything for and you're just trying to get strangers to like you and you have no idea how so if you Man. want if you want a microcosm of life go to a three man comedy show when the pandemic lifts and you'll see it here's the 8 year old with braces. that's amazing i hadn't really oh, oh just i got to tell you stand up comedy there's nothing to me that seems scarier than that it's um, think of it as a roller coaster. The the peaks are incredible. When you kill as a comic, there is no greater feeling on earth. You feel invincible. And when you bomb, you just want to crawl under a rock because oh. it's devastating. Now, as you get older, your bombs don't you know they they they're not as bad. They're not H bombs anymore. They're like little you know. M80s. So you you can <laughs> mitigate the damage because you just know how to bomb. But man, when you're starting out and you bomb, it is <sighs> utterly devastating. And you just think, I, I'm that's it. I'm done. I can't show my face again. I can't go out and check the mail. People are going to know. And then you have to find the courage to get back up there, try it again. And as soon as you get a laugh, you go, oh, okay. All right. All right. I'm going to survive this. Yeah, I'll be okay. I'll be okay. But oh, that's man. childhood. I mean, how devastating was it if you wanted to try something out for your friends or just try to ingratiate yourself with the crowd or approach somebody that you had a crush on and it didn't work? You got no material to fall back on. It's, yeah, it's, it is crazy. Just in every, every first and every, yeah like new situation where you're just like trying to figure it out as you go along it's uh whew. yeah i keep I, I keep inspiring this look in your eyes i'm thinking i think i'm making her relive too many moments here <laughs> <laughs> maybe i should move on i think oh, I'm, man. i just put her back at the freshman mixer and it's I'm, not going I'm, well i'm reliving i'm reliving some really uh some hardcore stuff here folks man <laughs> on a very special episode yeah. Chris uh, yeah. On the next Chris Edgerly, Kari Walgan comes clean about the years 14 so through 19. It's so hard. 
Um, yeah, well, if we were to talk about the years 14 through 19 for me, it would be the exact same. How socially advanced was I at 19 compared to 14? The same. The same. Not a Aww. single step forward. I knew a lot more about Dungeons and Dragons, but damn if I could tell you what a girl might like. I knew a lot about musical theater. Okay. I knew a lot about ventriloquism. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I was a child of ventriloquist. That let's let's just like drop that little bomb right there. Okay. <laughs> like, ooh. I um I never tried ventriloquism. I knew I was never gonna be any good at it, but I have to say, usually kid ventriloquists is not that's usually not uh prom king and queen, also. That's uh um I <laughs> All right, I'm getting more of the face. I think I, I see that I've <laughs> I it's it's weird. It was it I was well liked, but I was I was definitely quirky. Okay. So, well, all right. Imagine every creative impulse you had existing in my body and going to an all boys private Catholic military school. Oh. So they, don't don't feel so bad. There you Ooh, go. I suddenly feel better. There you go. See? See how I yeah. did that? Yeah. See thank how I you. threw you a lifeline there? Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't feel so I don't bad. Think my lot doesn't feel so bad. <laughs> yeah. See? That's that, you know. You're now a giver. You, thank you, Chris. I try. I try. But I did notice that, yes, like you said, all the creative impulses, when you start to realize how to channel them. Now, some people learn this at seven or eight. They say, okay. That was a pretty weird thing for me to have said. It sounded totally normal to me, but I look at their expressions. I'm going to pick my spot next time. Me, I would just keep charging ahead. I, I had no ability to read the room at that age. It was, this is in my head, it's coming out. By the time I got into college, I got better at it. And that's where I started doing stand-up. And mm. for better or for worse, you learn how to read the room, read the audience. And I realized that some of those wacky creative impulses helped me out a bit to where by the time I was in my early 20s, I had significantly caught up because I had done shows and you could be the biggest dork in the world. But if you go on stage and you make everybody laugh, when you get off that stage, you're the prom king. Mm -hmm. Your social status completely flipped. So was there a point where you suddenly started to just notice that, all right, I've put all this creative work in the bank. Now I can start having it pay out dividends? Was there a point in your life where you saw it pivot for you? That's, it's a hard question. Um, I, I guess I started seeing it in certain ways early on. Like uh -huh. I got my first um, uh, professional voiceover job actually when I was young, when I was younger. Okay. And then I, you know, I had auditioned while I was in college my senior year for a Shakespeare festival and I got a role in that. So I basically graduated and then started rehearsals the next day wow. for the Shakespeare company. Um, so I, I like right out of college, I was booking a lot of professional theater and stuff mm. like that. And then, you know, moved out to Los Angeles and um, uh, with an eye towards doing more TV and film and voiceover. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it felt like there were some some wins early on to at least feel like, OK, this this maybe wasn't such a pipe dream or, right. you know, like could this could legitimately possibly turn into something. Right. Um, so, yeah, so there there was that. I, I mean, it. I definitely when I moved out to L.A., uh, I. I kind of quickly got into the whole auditioning for on-camera stuff and, and getting kind of frustrated and kind of soured on that experience. Um, you know, I'd go into auditions and I'd see these, these really, really beautiful girls and I would hear them do their auditions through the door and they were terrible. Like they yeah. were terrible. And, and, they the casting directors would be walking them out and I'm like oh my gosh you did amazing you know oh we just love meeting you and I would go in and give what I felt was a pretty solid audition and they're which like which I'm sure it was yeah and they'd be like okay thanks yeah so you know I kind of got disillusioned 
earlier on in my time in LA with the whole on camera thing for a while. Mm -hmm. And that was about the point where I, I kind of said, okay, I'm going to just take a step back from this and I'm just going to focus all my attention on the voiceover side of things. Yeah. Um, and then that's when the voiceover side really started to take off. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, I don't know. I, I feel like I've, I've gotten enough little hits or enough positives over the years to make me feel like, okay, this is, this path seems to be going the right direction. Right. I have often said, and this is one of the ways that, um, sometimes it feels like that creativity is going to take longer to pay off, but um, people ask me about LA. They ask me what it's like. And I said, everything you've heard is true. I don't care how crazy or out there or stereotypically cliche and bland you've heard. It's all true. I will find yeah. you an example of all of it. And for me, Hollywood is high school without the teachers. That's all. You just take the adults out of the room and you have the same clicks, the nerds, the pew, you know, the pretty people, the uh the the wild crazy rebellious ones the jocks and you just see them at auditions and yep. so yeah you see the <laughs> yeah the prom queen comes in and just babbles out something incoherent not that there aren't lovely accomplished brilliant prom queens but stereotypically speaking yeah spits out barely gets the words in order and everyone gushes over it and you go in there and you're prepared and you knock it out of the park and they say yeah okay because your audition was walking through the door. That's really all it is. It's like, yeah, we're si we've sized everyone up as they walk in the room. And if they, you know, can put two words together, you're going to get it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's a really good point. Like it's a, it's, it's horrible and hilarious at the same time, the whole high school uh, analogy, because it's yeah. so true. Um, yeah, no teacher comes along and says, hey, cut that out. Stop that. You shouldn't be that way. Yeah. So, yeah, there's no teacher to come in and, and clean it all up and say, no, this is how you're supposed to behave. No, they've left. They, yeah. they, they're gone. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I do think it's really, really important. You know, anybody that wants a career in the entertainment industry, I really feel like it's so important to, to build a life outside of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that you have some sort of frame of reference, like some sort of perspective um, so that it won't eat you alive. You know, yeah. you have friends that care about you, whether or not you're booking something, you've got hobbies that you love to do. If you're not working as much, you've got, you know, th just other things that make your life worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, because man, it can, it can really be a mind, mind screw yeah. You can say mind f if you want. It's all right. I'll you can say it as a character. So it's not really you. It's, it's a mind f <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's true. I mean, you, uh, your, your success is predicated upon how much you are able to get someone to like you, whether it's the casting director or the director. And, uh, and then by an extension, the audience. And uh, I guess if I were to sum it up, you've got three people in this career that you want to impress. One is the director. Well, first, the casting director, because that'll get you the job. Second, the director, so you can keep the job. And third is yourself. You've got to be happy with your performance. Everybody else is kind of uh, really secondary even the audience, because so many other hands are going to touch your performance after you've given it. Oh, I, I completely agree with this. And, and here's the other thing is that you cannot control the public reaction to your work. No, you can do an amazing job. Like I've, I've worked on series that were phenomenal and they mm. lasted one season. Mm. Uh, and it's just the way of it, you know, uh, I've, I've done characters that people love. I've done characters that people hated and I'm giving my all to every single one of those jobs. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like you, you can't go into it thinking I'm going to give the people what they want because you just never know. You just, right. you know, I, so for me, I, I kind of just go in and, uh, you know, I do my best job on that day. Right. 
with the circumstances that I'm given, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes, sometimes it's an off session or, you know, there are tech problems or whatever, but you know, my job as I see it is to show up and give the best performance that I can on that given day. And then just to kind of wash my hands of it because, you know, right. the rest of it's out of my control. Yeah. Do you, you know? have a job that sticks out in your mind, even if you don't share with us the specifics, but was there a job where you were more emotionally invested than normal because you just loved it and you couldn't believe that it didn't click for whatever reason? You know, I've, I've had it happen much more often that there is just red tape or mm -hmm. studio things. Mm -hmm. Like there's a company buyout or, or new people come in right. and immediately cut all the shows so that they can bring their own shows in. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've worked on shows that I was just like, this is an amazing show. Mm -hmm. And we did a season of it and there is just nothing I can do because the company got bought out by somebody else or they it changed hands and, you know, right. There's nothing that anybody could do. Right. Um, I, I remember working on one pilot and all of us in the room, we did not in an ensemble record and all of us in the room were just kind of looking at each other and being like, is everybody feeling how electric this is? Yeah it was palpable right and i think it was for disney and uh -huh. disney did some test specs and stuff after we recorded the pilot and they deemed that the lead girl character was too morally ambiguous and so <laughs> uh they scrapped it they scrapped the show but i mean it, it was one of the few times where I've walked out with a group of people and we're like, this is going to series. Yeah. Like it's, this is, this is going to be a huge hit. Mm -hmm. And you know, I have had I, that immediately made me think of three times where I was a part of something and I thought this is going to be amazing. And it was either, I was either uh, fired or yeah. it never got picked up or it didn't get the response they were hoping for. And all three were Disney projects. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. And I love Disney. I loved them since I was a kid. I love doing anything for Disney. Uh, anything at all I get to book for them, I get to do. I absolutely love it. But by virtue of having done so many things for Disney, it was inevitable something was going to happen that just didn't work out. One was a series, I was the lead. It just, they couldn't decide on what they wanted. And after like 12 or 13 episodes of recording oh. of halfway through a 26 order, you know, how many series get a 26 episode order before they even start recording? I was replaced. And then seven other guys got replaced on that same oh. part. It took them forever to figure out what they wanted. It's, it's cool. You know, I landed on my feet. I was in uh, Disney's The Wild, which was uh, an animated feature they did while they were still negotiating with Pixar to re-up their contract with them. So this was done completely independently of anything Pixar. And Bob Joles and I did the voice of uh, two chameleons in the movie. And Bob told me later, the test audiences love the chameleons more than anything in the movie. They're talking about giving them their own show. And I said, oh my God, yes. Because this was about 15 years ago when I was still, you know, I was doing all right, but I was waiting to find something to really push through. And the movie just didn't, it didn't do the business they wanted to do, so that got scrapped. And there was one time in uh, a pilot for Disney. It was for a Mulan uh, a series based on the movie. And this was, yeah. again, this was probably 15 years ago. All this stuff was happening to me right around the same time. Oh, jeez. 12, 15 years ago. And I was surrounded by a couple of people from the original cast and I was doing, I did Harvey Fierstein because he didn't want to do the pilot. So he couldn't be bothered to do the actual show. So I did his character. Because who else, I don't think anyone else could do that. And they thought, I'm going to have no throat if I do that. So I could do it. And I thought, there's no, Frank Welker was in the room with us. And I thought, there's no way that this doesn't go. There's just no way. And then I found out later they had commissioned four pilots based on four Disney movies and they went with the Emperor's New School based on the Emperor's New Groove. And I thought, okay, 
and I'm, I'm sitting here surrounded by amazing, every time I'm surrounded by amazing actors. And that teaches you the lesson that you were always surrounded by amazing actors and the wow. industry has so much to choose from. They'll say, sorry, we'll take this project full of amazing legendary people and can these other projects full of amazing legendary people. people. Yeah, it's, Oh, you know, oh, and, and it just made me think of, I think, one other situation that I've had happen is where I booked the pilot. Okay. Uh, recorded the pilot. Uh, and, and and it was two lead characters that with lots of snappy dialogue and stuff. Uh -huh. So the guy and I recording it, bouncing back and forth. And, you know, we just left that and we're like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? It was amazing. And it got picked up for like a whole 26 episodes or something like that and they took it to canada they took it to canada and so they cast voice matches for us oh yeah that what? one was, that one was a stab in the heart that one was was really rough oh my like, god oh. yeah but why well i guess look it's usually money well it's not usually even usually money it's always money so yeah. i was like well i guess that they really did love what i did they I love my guess. interpretation. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. But right. it, so I guess, I don't know, the, the, the one kernel of comfort that I can take from all of this is, is that, again, it goes back to that, you know, you're giving your best performance on that day that you are hired. Right. You know, so that is, that is my job is to do my best for that one session. Mm -hmm. And also that it's, it is about like the goal for me is to make my living doing this. Yeah. So, so if I can take my ego out of the equation and sometimes it's really hard and sometimes it's, you know, uh, you know, tiny little moments of soul crushing and, and whatever. But if I can, if I can kind of step back and be like, Hey, you know, the dream, the, the awesome thing is that this is what I get to do for a living. Yeah. Yeah. And I know there, yeah, there you go. Don't underestimate that. Oh, by the way, we got raided. It's a Twitch thing, but SVCK Ducker raided with a party of 17 people. Thank you. In other words, they ended their stream and they brought people with them. So oh. it's like a flash mob coming into your party and it's people you want Woo! there. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, I think people underestimate the actual advantage of doing something you love and getting paid for it because if you look at, especially yeah. nowadays, how hard it is for a family to make ends meet. And usually it's doing a job that they don't particularly like. Sometimes they loathe that job, but it's what they could get. And they have to make sure that they pay the mortgage, keep the lights on, put clothes on their back, put clothes on their kids' backs, make sure they get to a good school. All of these things that they have to check off from a list to have a quality of life. And when you're able to have all of those things, the things that you normally only get from a steady job, when you can get that from the absolute roller coaster minefield that is the entertainment industry, when you get to have all of the checklists and you do it because you get to do voices, I, I just yeah. think it's an amazing win. I, I think working actors sometimes forget that. I, I absolutely agree with you. And, and, and then it makes it extra special in those moments where it does pan out in your favor yeah. you know when, when you do get the show that you're on that mm -hmm. keeps you and that you get m multiple seasons from mm -hmm. or you, know, you you start out doing scratch for something and then they keep it in the movie um, yeah. you know, there's there's so many opportunities like that where when it does go your way it makes it kind of extra satisfying absolutely well yeah. as you can see i'm a fan of analogies so you're a, you're a sports fan, right? I am. You, I am. You follow the, uh, I guess you'd follow the Jayhawks, right? Follow the Jayhawks, follow the Chiefs. The Chiefs, all right. You guys, the Chiefs, uh, I, I was rooting for them. I was happy I, for them. I would have been, I would, I would have been, you know, obviously disappointed if, if they had lost, but if there was anybody else that would have won, I would have. I like won. seeing the Niners too. Yeah. Niners. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was pretty yes. awesome. But if you're a sports was, fan. A lot of times you get mad about calls. Ah, the calls didn't go our way. But over the course of a game, or sometimes it takes a whole season, the calls even out. 
they balance out. You get some calls go against you. You get some calls that go for you. A career is like that. You're going to get some, yeah. sometimes it doesn't go your way and it's not fair. But other times, like I've had jobs where I knew I gave the best performance. I didn't get it. Maybe I was wrong, but I just felt like, ah, that was mine. I didn't get it. Or I got it and then they didn't go to a series with it or something didn't work. But mm -hmm. other times I've just absolutely fallen into something. something. I feel like there's no way you guys chose me. Are you serious? Did you see who else was in that room? <laughs> Come on, you know, and no, it's like, no, you're it. Okay. All fine. right. You're going to pay me. I'll, I'll talk into the can, but you know, you yeah. make it a big mistake. So yeah, I, I just, it, it evens out. It evens out. It, I, I firmly believe that. Yeah. Which is why I think persistence is super important. If I can get on my soapbox for, for one. Sure. Second. Soapbox my, it up. My, my piece of advice out there is just. Persistence, persistence, persistence. Well, would you agree that when you see the way things are cast on camera, you realize this isn't really about merit. This is about they need a certain look. They want a certain aesthetic to the show. A lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times in voice acting, I have found that it is more of a meritocracy as far as can you do the work? OK, because if you can't, they're going to know you you uh, you can't yeah. bullshit your way through this business you can't i i mean you can kind of land one voiceover job maybe two mm -hmm. without being a great actor right but you can't sustain a career right you just you can't in voiceover it's too competitive there are too many good people and you can't fake it like you can't hide it right um you know, the, the timing moves faster on a lot of stuff. You know, they just don't have the time to handhold with a lot of things. Yeah. So I, I do find that one of the things I love so much about voiceover is that to sustain any sort of longevity, um, you know, and I've been, I've been out in LA at the end of October, it'll be 20 years. Nice. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, I haven't been here as long as, a lot of folks, but you know, it's still a sizable chunk of time and, and to sustain longevity in voiceover, you've got to be good. Yeah. You, you've really got to be good. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess I comfort myself with that. <laughs> You're good. I guess, I guess like I always like, man, I don't want to like say, well, I'm good, no, I'll but... say it. No, there's a reason why you work as much as you do. There is a reason. There's a reason why you have the IMDb credit list that you do because it isn't based on, oh, she fit this look that we wanted and the acting was secondary. The acting is primary in voice acting. Yeah. But like you said, you might have a voice that perfectly fits what one production is looking for and that's it. You're going to get away with that. And if it's for a series, you're in luck because usually you're not going to get 13 tries to get something right. You just happen right. to fit it. But um, no, if you uh, like, for example, Will Smith said early in his career, he says, I was not a good actor. If you watch if you watch early episodes of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, you'll see sometimes my lips are moving because I'm mouthing the line of the person I'm doing the scene with before oh. my line comes in. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, I've seen myself, I've seen footage of me doing that, doing voiceover, where I was like just timing it before I start talking. Yeah. Which is weird because my lines are in front of me. But, and Will Smith is an extremely bright guy. I think he was accepted at MIT, but that doesn't always translate to acting. And he says, but because I had, I had a recording career, I had, you know, I, he has a lot of natural charisma and energy. And yep. he was already a star. So he was fortunate that he got to learn and he learned quickly. And now he's, he's a fantastic actor. You see him in Ali, you see him in the pursuit of happiness. The guy knows how to act, but he got years to figure it out. He got time. And in voice acting, if you're in there just, you know, knocking over scenery and stepping on people's lines and things like that, it's like, the, yeah, the, look, we got a lot of people that can do exactly what we're asking you to do. So yeah, yeah. You, you don't get that learning curve, like you say. Yeah, you just, I mean, I, 
I, I, my first series that I booked like as a lead, um, was super robot monkey team, hyperforce go uh-huh. for, uh, for Disney's, uh, I think it was called Jetix mm-hmm. channel at the time. They were like launching that channel for boys or something. Mm-hmm. It's out on, um, Disney plus now. So if, you haven't checked it out and you like any of that kind of Western cartoon with like anime influences in it mm-hmm. way ahead of its time. Great show. But the cast for that, it was Tom Kenny, Clancy Brown, wow. Greg Sipes, Kevin Michael Richardson, wow. and uh, uh, Mark Hamill and Corey Feldman. <laughs> wow. And, and so it was just like a master class every single session. And I would just show up, I would pray that I wouldn't wet myself during the session. And I would just try to learn as much as I could from everything going on around me. Right. Soak it all in because, you know, those are the, my gosh, getting to learn from those guys. I would have loved to have just heard Corey Feldman tell stories between takes. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. It was, there were, there were some good stories. Yeah. A lot (laughs) of stories there. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I found myself in a room surrounded by people. One of the jobs I had was on Celebrity Deathmatch when they brought it back for MTV2. Again, we're talking 14, 15 years ago. They would bring in voice matches for every single episode because all these celebrities are fighting each other. And I got to work with so many amazingly talented people that I was just sitting here thinking, this is such a fun job to have because of all the personalities that keep coming into this room and sitting down. And they do their segment and they leave and then you bring in another set. And that was, we had about 16 episodes of that. And that's when you tell yourself, this really is a lot of fun. So it's, yeah. it's a great job to have. When it's working out for you, it's, it's, as, it's as good as it can get. Yeah. When it's, when it's working out, um, it's uh, all the, the hype is true. Yeah. Somebody on the chat was saying, Luke from Star Wars? It's like, yes, yes. the voice of Joker. I I got to work with him on one thing, and it was for Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law. He played Ricochet Rabbit. So, Because what Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law did was it took all these old Hanna-Barbera characters, took them into the new age, and made them basically plaintiffs and defendants in legal cases. So Mm -hmm. Ricochet Rabbit, an old Hanna-Barbera character, was a rabbit that they deemed to be hyperactive. He has ADHD, and they put him on Adderall. (laughs) <laughs> and, and he was just zonked out of his mind. And, you know, they were arguing that he should be taken off the medication. And Mark Hamill, I just, you know, and this is before they brought, you know, him back to be in the third trilogy. So he was just known for his, uh, for his voice work at that point. And I thought, but I know who he is. And he was the nicest guy to talk to. Yeah. Such a wonderful personality. And I, I practically begged him to sign my script. So I have him signing as Ricochet Rabbit my Harvey Birdman script. That Man. might be the only Mark Hamill ricochet rabbit autograph that ever existed. I gotta tell you, I've, I've worked with him on a few projects. Like uh-huh. we did a whole series together. We, we did, well, we did a couple series together at least. Yeah. So three or four times with different things. And I've never, ever had the courage to ask him for like a picture. No. I didn't get I, pictures then. I just said, I never, this. I just, I, I, I just never wanted to bother him, right. but he's just like the sweetest and like, he just, and, and he's so respectful to mm-hmm. people in the voiceover industry, which I love, like, mm-hmm. you know, on social media, he, he will just give shout outs to people in, in VO oh, yeah. or respond to things. And, and he just really has such a, such an appreciation for that world and a respect for it. It's just, wonderful mm-hmm. i i have such such uh high regard for him mm-hmm. well i think we should take a couple of questions because <laughs> people are hearing these names getting thrown around and they might yeah, they might have yeah. a question or two also yeah. i have a hard out in about 10 more minutes because oh, uh, we're we're okay. showing our condo uh see we want to we want to own a house just like you so we're in a we're in a nice condo, but we need a yard. We the kids need to graze. You know they need to get out. Like your cats, you can just let them out every now and then. Um, just keep yeah. the collar on. So yeah, exactly. So we have to get out, and then you know because it pandemic times, you can't just throw the doors open and have an open house. So yeah, 
So yeah, we'll we'll take uh, we'll take some feedback questions here. Um, right. Eric Tyler, friend of the stream, always on. How was it working on Gravity Falls? Oh, it was great. It was really, really great. I I came in for one ep episode to start with, mm -hmm. and it was for Chandra Jimenez and a couple of other little incidental things. And then they just kind of kept calling me in for more and more little side parts. So yeah, I ended up doing a, a lot of episodes of that. And it was just always really fun. Is this one of those jobs that sort of, it's happened with me they end up discovering that, oh, they're like a Swiss army knife. We bring them in for one thing. And while you're there, that's, that's your chance to ingratiate yourself. yourself. Yes, I'm stealing that. I'm stealing that, Chris. Yes, that's, it was with yeah. army knife job. That, yeah, that is um, most, 90% uh, of the work I've done in animation has been Swiss army knife, where I might not have been the first choice to be the lead, but, you know, we need some utility guys. It's like, oh, Edgerly's all over the map. Bring him in. And yeah. that's what ends up happening. I will get, uh, I will be this guest star. I've done so many guest stars as opposed <laughs> to like regular leads on series. And I thought, fine, I'm a character actor in voice acting. There you go. It's a living. Yeah, I will take it. Absolutely. Uh, Albatza Ob was saying, who do you voice on Gravity Falls? Well, apparently a lot of people. Like, yeah. They're, yeah. I want to say like Pacifica's mom also. Mm -hmm. Chandra Jimenez is the big recurring one. Um, but yeah, then there were just like all sorts of villagers and kids and right. Yeah. Now this happened to me once where after a certain amount of work, you start to think, I think I've done this voice before and, it, but it was on a completely different project. It was for this thing or that thing. And you realize that, okay, it's inescapable that at some point I'm going to repeat a voice. It won't be by design. Yeah. There's just only so much that the human, you know, esophagus can manage. The, the voice <laughs> box can muster up. Have you found that there is a certain pocket of a voice that people call on the most with you? Or is it still sort of all over the place? It's kind of all over the place. And I and I tend to go in, uh, it, it's gone in waves over the mm -hmm. years. Like I had a... a <clears throat> span of time where I was just playing spunky little girls. Uh -huh. And then I had a span of time where I was paying, playing sexy villainesses. Mm -hmm. And then I had a span of time where I was playing a ton of grandmas and babies. <laughs> so it just kind of, yeah, it just is all, all over. Yeah. And it's funny because you can do all of those over the course of one page, depending on the show. Yeah. Depending on the show. Yeah. Have you had that happen where you've almost gotten whiplash because, oh, the, uh, the spunky kids here and the sexy villainess is trying to take her picnic basket and she's going to be saved by the radical grandma and I'm all three. Is yes. That, yeah. Yeah. I just had, I, I had a, a fun session like that actually just a couple days ago. Uh -huh. where I'm pretty much, it's, it's a short and I was all, all of the characters in the short, except for a bear. Except for a bear. Except for a bear. Well, I, I wouldn't put that past you, though. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Someone is asking here, were you in Passengers, Chris? Yes, I was in Passengers. The Chris Pratt, um, uh, Jennifer uh, um, Lawrence Lauren? movie. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, technically, I'm in it, but I'm not physically in it. I'm the voice of the uh, infomat in Passengers. So I got to act with Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence but it was months after they gave their performance. There is a thing about voice acting people do not always realize. Just because they're talking to the CGI rendering of my character doesn't mean I'm there on the set. So they were talking to probably a tennis ball and uh, on a stick and, you know, for reference, for eyeline. And somebody offset was probably feeding them lines. I didn't even get cast for that until months later. And then I show up at the studio and I look at a big screen and I fill in the dialogue from there. And you've done many of those things. I mean, do you have feature film examples of something you've done that's that's pretty prevalent, you know, in your in your CV? Um, well, something that I thought of, it's not a feature film, but I was the voice of um, Ms. Luthor's AI Hope on the Supergirl TV series. Oh, really? So I did a, did a couple episodes of that. So 
yes, Miss Luthor. You know, would you like me to kill Supergirl? I can do that for you. You know, so it was that, that kind of thing. Uh, Sloth Fu Chimp is asking, have you ever wanted to do on-camera work? Well, you have done on-camera work. I have, yeah. I, I've, I've done Criminal Minds. I've done a, a couple or a few episodes of uh, Wizards of Waverly Place. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done a number of commercials. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I've done some on-camera as well. Did you do the Swiffer commercial? I remember I it. Yeah, I see. Swiffer Mud Girl. Whenever I hear What About Love by Heart, <laughs> I think, Kari Walgren. That was the most fun. I, I actually got rigged up to wires and they actually hoisted me up to a huge Swiffer pad up by a ceiling and I smacked against it. So wow. I did my own stunts. Yeah. Oh my goodness. What okay. About love? All right. I am going to have to wrap this up, which is a shame because we could talk for another two hours. Um, yes. Uh, slothful chimp. Sorry. All right. Well, uh, you accidentally mistyped slothful chimp. Okay. Yeah. Typos on gamer tags on Twitch. Those are a bitch, aren't they? All right. Sorry about that. Anyway, everybody. Um, well, Kari, right, you'll just, you'll have to come back. We'll have to do another uh-huh. one of these and we'll, we'll talk about more stuff because I would love for people to be able to hear some of the voices you, you do. I know that, you know, I don't want to try and coax them out of you cause I don't want to be, you know, douchey and say, do another one, do another, do one. another one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do the baby and the grandma and the villain is doing right now. Go. I need content. Oh, I, man. I know I get like, I get stage fright. Like when I'm put on the, do you? On the spot to to like i'm like oh i gotta think of something really oh, yeah okay. voicey. i gotta do something voicey yeah no you don't have to do anything voicey here this is about yeah. your this is about you kari walgren all right all that swedish irish immigrant that's right that's right einstein the einstein uh, uh visa it, it, the one that fell off the ship was definitely not waiting on an Einstein visa when they got there. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So anyway, well, all right. Well, may they rest yeah. in peace. Um, okay. <laughs> this this was fun. We'll we'll have to have you back because, yeah, we got to bug out of here. So in the meantime, Kari, is there anything you would like to say to the viewers and the fans out there who have enjoyed all your work? Uh, just thank you guys so much for, for tuning in. It's just um, you guys make this job so much fun you know it's it's when we hear back from you guys saying oh this thing that you did made a difference to me that that makes it really makes it all rewarding so um thanks and if you guys are on social media it, you can find me on twitter and instagram and facebook official at kari walgren and uh go find her yeah come find me yeah absolutely you'll get to learn about her band slot her and you'll get to see dorky <laughs> childhood pictures Yes, you will. That's all <laughs> you win-win. need. Okay. All right, Kari, I will message you afterwards and we'll talk about Spain. Awesome. Yes, right. please. All yes, right. I will. Thanks for having you me, are Chris. the best. You guys. Take care.